started here. Uh, my name is Blake Kimsey. I am the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas up here in Dallas. And I cannot believe we've been doing this for three years when David Samuel Levinson. I love also, it. Also matches Steve's book cover, just like yeah. Mandy. When, Wait, uh, what? I do? Yeah, you and Mandy are, are dressed for Remember Thank This. Thank you oh, yeah. for doing this for me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. all for you, man. Hi, Good Mandy. Work. Hi. <laughs> So David had this great idea for a, 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 a book club during the pandemic. And so we did that for a while. Then we just changed it to the Big Texas Author Talk. And so we're just kind of keeping it going and having these great conversations. So I'm really happy that Writing Workshops Dallas has gotten to know Gemini Inc. Um, through David. So thank you very much. Um, we always love to thank um, our sponsors um, here. Um, you know, we have a, a grant from Humanities Texas, which allows us uh, to run this series, which is pretty phenomenal, uh, excuse me, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and thanks to Jim and I Inc. for always doing the grant writing for that, which is awesome. And uh, thanks to our wonderful authors uh, who are here tonight, um, Ramona Reeves and Steve Adams. So I'm going to let uh, Mandy say a little bit about Jim and I Inc. and then I'll do a formal introduction for both Steve and Ramona, and then we'll be off to the races. So thanks. Thanks, Mandy. Good deal. Thank you. My name is Mandy Lynn and I'm the public class coordinator for Gemini Inc. We're San Antonio's writing art center. Um, so it is, it is our duty to help teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels to help them bring their stories to life. And just as every month, we're really excited to be here partnering with Writing Workshops Dallas and, you know, funded by Humanities Texas to have this monthly conversation where, where we talk about the craft of writing with Texas connected authors. So thank you, Steve and Ramona for being here and Blake, I'll let you introduce them. Okay, here we go. Well, we are very happy to have tonight's uh, discussion lead our moderator, Ramona Reeves, who is the winner of the 2022 Drew Hines Literature Prize for her interlinked short story collection. It falls gently all around and other stories, which was published by University of Pittsburgh Press last October. Ramona's work has appeared in New South's micro series, Southampton Revue, Review, Pembroke, Bio Magazine, Superstition Review, Texas Highways and others. Um, and you can also find out more information at Ramona Reeves website. Thank you for being here tonight, Ramona. Thank and you. Being in conversation with Steve Adams, whose creative nonfiction has won a Pushcart Prize, been listed as notable in Best American Essays and published in The Pinch, The Millions and Elsewhere. In fiction, he's won Glimmer Train's Short Story Award for New Writers, and his stories have been anthologized and published in Glimmer Train, the Missouri Review, and elsewhere. He's been a guest artist at UT, a resident at Gentile, and a scholar at the Norman Mailer Writers Colony. And his plays have been produced in New York City. His debut novel, Remember This, was published in October 2022. And Steve is a writing coach and a freelance editor who lives in Memphis. Thank you all both so much for being here tonight. I'm going to hand it over to you and spotlight you. And so um, if you have any questions for Steve or Ramona, put those in the chat and we'll be sure to get those at the end when we have some Q&A. Ramona, Steve, thanks. Thank you, um, Blake, and also Mandy. And um, thank you, Steve, for asking me to moderate tonight. I'm so excited to talk about your novel, Remember This. Um, and I'll just let folks know that um, we met probably a decade ago when you were in Austin. Um, you actually helped me stay accountable with getting the first draft of my book done, the one that was just published. Um, and we found out, we reconnected last year. When we found out we had a book coming out about a month apart. And uh, we we appeared up at Interra Bang together um, in the fall. And then this came along and you said, hey, do you want to moderate? And I said, man, that would be great. So here I am. Um, uh, do you want to, would you like to say a few things, Steve, before we yeah, get into I the just, discussion? I just want to thank, uh, yeah, for, thanks, Austin. Thanks, Ramona, for doing this. This makes it, you know, extra fun for me. Um, and it's fun how we reconnected after that, after, you know, a bit of time. I definitely want to thank uh, Blake and Riders Workshop Dallas and uh, Mandy and Gemini Inc. I mean, as you get out in the world with the book and you, you realize that uh, 
there's you need the infrastructure to support you so people can find out about a book and it doesn't happen by accident you kind of think it does you think it's always going to be there but it's people who love literature and I'm sure they don't get paid as much as they should and they work anyway so that they're going to be a forum like this where Ramona and I can appear and I really appreciate it so so thanks guys so, and, so we'll uh we'll get to yeah, it let's roll yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so I'm, you know, like I said, I'm really excited for readers. Uh, people who've read your book already know how great it is. Uh, people who are here who are checking out your book for the first time, um, I'm really excited for them because it's just beautifully written. Um, and part of that beauty is the way that you render place, which we've talked about before. Um, and for those who haven't read your book, it moves between two timelines, um, New York City in the 1980s, and then Texas in the 1960s to the early 80s until the whole thing sort of begins to, to dovetail. Um, so, it, so it's very much, I mean, to me, a novel of place. Um, can you talk about how you arrived at those two timelines and a little bit about your characters? Yeah, yeah. And this is probably the, you know, the, the longest question I will, or longest answer I'll have tonight. But uh, it's really important. And uh, I was real pleased when people have called this a, a love letter to New York City. It, it is. Um, so there are, what, what did I say? It's, um, people wonder, oh, is this autobiographical and stuff? And it's it's not, but I use the framework of my life, you know, kind of just as, as a scaffolding. So for instance, I lived in, you know, Texas and I moved to New York City. New York City was a really, really important place for me. It still is. I'm kind of a New Yorker in exile and a Texan and a Southerner. Um, all of these things. Um, but I was, I've lived in New York City three times, and I was there during the period that uh, this novel is set. It's set in the a summer of 1988, and I was there probably from 86 to 91 or 92, and it was just, uh, I kind of came into myself there. It was one of the most uh, uh, in, in meaningful times of my life, and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was beautiful and tragic. I mean, AIDS shadowed everything and I was uh, writing plays and, you know, have a day, a good day job and running around and seeing these little productions and my actor friends. And, and uh, it was just uh, such a, a dynamic, you know, and it was a grittier, grittier New York too. I mean, you know, you just got used to prostitutes and pimps and people selling drugs on Times Square with all the glamour of, of, of uh, you know, uh, the theaters too. So this whole thing was just mixed together and you just learn to move through it. So I've never, uh, like if I probably were to go to a live, relive a time of my life, probably it would be that period. So it would make sense that I would at some point want to write about it. Um, and so the story of how this this happened was I was living in New York City in 2008 when the economy collapsed and my job got kicked over to India. There was no work anywhere. It was really rough, and uh, I couldn't get any. I couldn't get another job, and I knew I'd have to leave. And I had uh, a certain amount of. I had a string of months left on my uh, lease for my apartment, and so I just wandered the city for those months and like my character John does in the book, he wanders a lot. And, you know, I was taking notes and, and just, just putting down impressions. And, you know, I felt this, a novel start to form, but you can't have a, you know, you can't have a, hang a novel on some sad guy wandering around, you know, going to miss a city. It's just not enough, even no matter how, how, how deeply I felt it. So the idea came to me of, um, of a character who was in love, um, who is in love with a, a married woman. She's probably the love of his life. A married woman who has an 18 month old daughter and um, they have two months together. So they know that. So this is kind of the clock on, this, on the, the main storyline. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna write about this, this love affair and the arc of it. And I, I could use that to, to, to you know, shape it. And, um, and so I wrote that out just as, you know, everything is collapsing in my life and I, left New York with with a rough draft and literally because because again the job situation was rough in Texas too not as bad as New York but I crash landed in my parents home and I where I'm right now and uh, I worked on um, getting that draft polished and I thought I had a novel there um, and I sent it to an editor who did not respond positively and she was harsher than she should have been but um, sometimes 
you know, sometimes they say you you get the teacher you need, not the teacher you want. And uh, in my case, because I had credits, so it didn't completely destroy me, but I really was counting on this book. And um, and and so anyway, I once I crawled out from under the bed from the reaction, I, I started thinking about what, you know, what what was wrong? I could, I've never been able to give up on this book. And it's been a long journey. Uh, but I, I realized I needed another focal point or another lens to look at John, the protagonist, so that we understand why he's this guy who's involved with a married woman and not only involved with, with her, why he's a guy who tends to be the other man in his relationships. Um, and it's, it, I mean, just I'm giving this away a little bit. It, the women pick him. He, he doesn't go chase, but they come to him. So that's kind of what happens. And I wanted to... Um, what can I say? It's, I wanted to come up with a reason and a why for that. So, so I was stuck in this situation. I, I wanted this, and and I was uh, actually talking to my younger sister. So those of you who've read this know that the uh, the sibling thing is really strong. But again, it's not autobiographical. Um, and I was talking to my single younger sister, who's six years younger than me, and she uh, about what to do with this. You know, how do I make people understand why John is the way he is? And she mentioned Jack Nicholson having a really complicated relationships with older sisters, and he's kind of the baby of the family, and some stuff like that. And it just started kicking around in my head, and I was, I had a chance uh, to go back to New York, uh, and just I needed to see it like one more time, and. Um, some friends of mine were leaving. They had a couch I could sleep on. So they said, hey, if you want to come back, now's the time before we move out. So I put frequent flyer miles together and decided I'm going to go back for, you know, one one more shot, which I really needed to do. And uh, and I swear, it's just as the plane was like lifting off or going down the runway, I got an image of uh, this five-year-old boy who's John and his three much older sisters. They are six years older and eight years older and 10 years older than him. So it's like formed almost a diamond shape in my mind. I, I see things in shapes a lot. And, but John's down here at the bottom, right? And these three sisters. And, and I suddenly knew this is the family. This is the family he was raised in. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, so then what do I do? I, just, I started working on it. I get the father off stage. So he dies right off the bat. And then the mother is uh, an emotionally unavailable alcoholic. So she's really off stage too. So the family is this basically a family of siblings. And they are, I put them in a, a, a town back in Texas, like uh, that's, you know, similar. I mean, they're different, but, but New Braunfels is a sweet town and it's kind of close to Austin. It wasn't big back then. And that felt right. So I, I put that there. So, so those were the two main places. Now, the New York part is very much external, you're seeing the city, you're seeing all the shadows, all the light, all this stuff constantly. And, um, and but the uh, New Braunfels place, that's all interior, it's all in the home, because that's where the stuff is going on between these kids and dealing with their mother. So, so those are the two, and then it slides over for you, you know, Texans and Austinites. Um, when he leaves home, um, because everyone leaves home one after the next, and and he takes on all basically takes on the the big roles of of trying to get his sisters out of the house because they all have this this like fairy tale they they tell each other about how each are going to leave one after the next and get out of this stultifying uh, house. So uh, when he finally is able to get out of there, he goes to UT in Austin, and that's around 1982, 83. I lived there then, and um, and it was just a great scene and I loved it it's the music and I worked at the first Whole Foods and everybody was just crazy and wild and uh, and so I knew I had a setting that I really could explore and develop and and work there so you know we had the Armadillo World Headquarters the, the end of that you know uh, uh, Raul's uh, Club Foot uh, Continental Club you know and I mean and there are a dozen other clubs that are really interesting I could talk about there there are are all in it so so those are the times so I'm writing about Austin and in New York City and this this house where the uh, the second storyline which is John as a child it starts weaving that together with the adult which is the main story so so that's basically the structure and Ramona I'm going to ask you if that was clear enough um, you know did that read to you or was it too complicated? 
No, that 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 definitely read to me. And I was going to say the I, I felt like if I if I didn't know how you uh, the book came together, um, I I would assume that you had written the whole thing as one piece from the get go. So I'm really happy that you that you mentioned that because I think a lot of times, um, you know, when you hear writers talk, it, it seems like oh they just it just you know must have just magically all sort of come together in this one story and you know a lot of times there's a there's just a lot of work and a lot of figuring things out before you get to that place yeah. um so yeah I, I mean I think it I think it really works um I was interested in both uh both timelines when I was reading the novel um so so yeah thank you for thank you for sharing that um one of the things I wanted to ask about too besides place and, and before I forget is is you mentioned rhyming action before to me, and uh, and I know what I think of rhyming action is, but I I wondered if you could just talk. It's one of those writer crafting things I know, but if you could talk about what you think it is and how you think it's working in your novel and and the effect that it helps to create. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's probably those of us who think in those terms have our own version of what it means, you know, because I think it's a little bit slippery. But uh, I read, and I don't know if this is who came up with it first. But it's a, this book, I don't know when it came out, but it's probably about in 2002 when I read. It's Charles Baxter has a uh, a book about writing theory. It's like one essay after the next. It's brilliant. And um, and he there are two that I remember, and I haven't read it in a long time, but two that I remember so specifically. One is where he talks about, um, I wrote it down, because I never remember, uh, never remember the word melodrama for some reason. It's probably a psychological reason. But he he has a, a brilliant essay on melodrama, which I'm not going to talk about. But he also had this thing about rhyming action. And it just hit home with me. Because I started, speaking of like a circuitous route, like with this novel, I started with poetry. And I thought that's all I was going to do for a while. And then I got into playwriting. And I thought that's all I was going to do. And then to turn through screenwriting. And way late. I suddenly realized, oh, it's prose. This is where I'm supposed to be. It took me a long time. But I learned, uh, you know, I know that the poetry and how to construct a poem and all this stuff uh, has, has a, you know, influenced my prose too. So uh, the idea of rhyming action, I mean, it's a simple idea, but and it's, everything's kind of around metaphor. But um, it's uh, where you you have something that repeats generally in action and if you're talking a novel you, you're over over a long you know a long book it it kind of builds so for instance in my book uh when john is a child and each of his three sisters he's trying to send them off away to be free in the world and he uh each time he's running after them uh behind their car and like pushing their car and he's i mean he's a little guy he's a little kid and he's yelling go 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 you know that's what he does and he hears the sound of his feet uh, against the pavement. And so each of those is different with each of those sisters, uh, but but it but it sets in the reader this 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 uh, sonic metaphor and this movement. So so when in the adult story later on, uh, John finds himself running down in a very dramatic scene, running down uh, a street in a bad part of New York City, and he hears the sound of his footsteps. It echoes back to all this stuff with his sisters, and um, and it it just really, I mean, it resonates, and and it's a way of doing this. And the reader might not even remember this whole thing with the sisters, but they might too. Uh, but the, but the point is, it's like it 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 creates a thing where the whole the whole is greater than the sum of the parts if this works right it all adds and and creates this uh resonance and, and impact um another thing this is just a, a quick one is uh he, he brushes he he's this little boy who loves his sisters i want, want to emphasize he loves his sisters so dearly and he helps them he's helping them to to be pretty for boys and helping that he's he's talking to their boyfriends and making sure they're okay. He's acting like dad in a way, and he's this little guy and he brushes their hair. He just, he loves brushing their hair. So it's a sensual thing. And, and he sees how they put on makeup. He, and he starts seeing there because he becomes an artist. And, and this is where he's getting visual. He's getting an education in, in shadow and shape and, you know, in color, right? Doing that as, as, a, as, a, as a child. So, so with all the hair, there's a lot of hair in this book. You know, all of that kind of is a rhyming sort of action thing too. 
and I'm just going to throw this in too, because it just reminds me of it. And I've heard screenplay writers talk about this stuff, uh, which I guess related and you don't have to have a, like an exact definition, but, but it all stimulates ways to create, um, you know, a uh, resonant work. So the, um, this would be an image system. Um, again, you can see how that's related. So I'm just going to say it's, it can be just um, an image system can be a series of images that appear in a work which build and kind of create an impact over, over, over the work. And again, you, you see it in, in screenplays or film a lot. Um, and for instance, I had someone come up and talk to me at a, at a reading about my book. And she came up to me and this is how, you know, you don't always know what you're doing. You just do it. And she uh, she was really excited by the book. And 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 she she basically said she wished she was in an English class, could write a paper about the use of windows in the book. And I was like, windows in the book? I, I didn't, you know, I didn't I never thought about it. And but then I thought about it and they're everywhere, especially in New York. You could almost call New York City a city of windows. And I, I write it that way, but I wasn't conscious of it. And look, my book cover, I'm gonna hold it up. It's a window on my book cover. <laughs> so um you don't always have to, to know, but if you know, then you can be conscious about it after you get drafts, you start working at it. But but I'm just real fascinated by the ideas of uh rhyming action and image systems and this sort of thing. So there's that's that's what I got. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it, it. It it seems like it's working on the like beneath the surface. There's like the surface, and then there's like what's going on beneath there that create different layers, maybe even like yeah, yeah. Um, so so you so you've mentioned a lot of different things. Um, it seems like it's a a good time to ask you to read. You want you want to read some? Yeah, I'll I'll yeah. take off and read and just again because the way I wrote this, yeah, you know, I've got the two stories that are echoing and interweaving throughout it. Um, context becomes really important. So I, I, I had trouble just pulling something out of the middle and, and it working. So I'm just going to start from the opening, read the, read the first, uh, um, read some pages up front. So um, here we go. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink. New York City, 1988. It was a Saturday night. It was summer and I rode the subway to meet her, not thinking it through. If anything, doing my best to not think it through. I was actually irritated at losing most of a precious Saturday night. My downtown six train stopped at Union Square where I stepped off to switch to the express. Couples going out on dates and clutches of young people waited on the platform laughing, looking forward to the evening. Two black kids beat rhythms with drumsticks on white plastic tubs turned upside down and the cadence reverberated off the concrete walls. Everyone moved to it whether they knew it or not. An uptown six local screeched into the station on the opposite platform. Nearby, a Middle Eastern man in a gray suit dropped a quarter into a payphone and began yelling over the noise into the receiver. My right heel tapped against the floor. I was wound up, though I told myself there was no reason to be. She and I were friends. I was doing her a favor. Jeremy had no doubt stopped by to see her too, probably more than once. We'd watch the movie, then I'd leave. I looked down the tunnel and spotted the headlight of an approaching downtown four express a moment later it barreled in front of me pulling with it a wall of wind and heat a stream of white kids poured out its doors and i squeezed past them and sat most of the riders remaining in the car were black or latino and like me headed to brooklyn i was white with long dark hair slightly built 28 from texas and on my way to watch a movie with my boss my friend after she'd gotten stuck at home with her baby the yellowing walls of the car were scarred with graffiti and street iconography, slashes and streaks of Krylon spray paint. We pulled from the station and into the tunnel, rattling, shaking down the line. It would have been better if we'd met at Union Square like we'd planned and caught a film there. Two hours and maybe a drink and I would have done my bit. But here I was on work duty on a Saturday night with no pay. The train squealed to a stop at Brooklyn Bridge where more people boarded, then the metal doors closed and we were off again to Fulton Street, then Wall Street, and the last stop in Manhattan, Bowling Green. The doors opened, a few late shift workers straggled in. 
She'd been going stir crazy alone with the baby all these days, she told me, and just wanted to have a night out, but would feel self-conscious sitting in the movie theater by herself. And we were friends after all, had worked together three years at this point. So what's the big deal of meeting for a movie in the city? More than anything, she just wanted to have a normal conversation with a grown up, have a drink. But her sitter canceled at the last moment. When she'd phoned to tell me, she'd sounded so disappointed. She had hesitated. A moment hung between us. Then I told her I had no other plans, and if she wanted, I could rent a video. I'd bring it over. It wouldn't be the same as going out, but at least she could talk to a grown-up. You really wouldn't mind, she asked. But taking the subway all the way out to Brooklyn, getting back, my night would be shot. Maybe I could take a cab back to Manhattan, hit a bar along the way. My fingernails tapped the plastic seat beside me. Rat-a-tat-tat, tat-a-tat-tat-tat. I noticed this noted it, pulled my hand into my lap and held it still. I needed to settle down. Instead of asking myself why, I stared through the marred windows of the car. The station walls were painted red-orange with black trim against a cream background. The color shone starkly. All the stations I passed and had passed each day on the subway must have had their own specific color themes. I'd failed to notice until now until this night. The train pulled away and we went down. We went under the water, under the deep mud of the Hudson toward Brooklyn and hurtled through the straight dark pass. The subway conductor thought he was a cowboy, gunning it and the clatter was deafening as the wind gyrated through the open windows. A couple of Latina girls wearing electric colors stood at the back of the car clutching silver handrails, grinned as they were jerked back and forth like dolls on strings. The lights went out and I sat in the darkness and racket. Then they flashed on again, then off, then on. And finally, the conductor cut the speed and we slowed, rising to the other side. My stomach fluttered from the shift in pace, from a rush of anxiousness at arriving in Brooklyn when there should be nothing to be anxious about, except that she and I worked together and she was my boss. Though somehow she never made us think of her like that. We loved her for it, did our jobs as well as we could so she never had to remind us and break the spell. <laughs> There was, there was nothing to be anxious about, I told myself. The boundaries were established long ago, though she got to me at first. It wasn't easy to shake off. I thought about the movie I'd chosen, Louis Malle's Atlantic City. I'd seen it before. It's a beautiful film. But there's that scene where Susan Sarandon takes off her shirt and washes herself with lemon juice over her sink, not knowing Burt Lancaster's watching her from across the way. It was too sexy. I'd made a mistake. She'd get the wrong idea. I'd, I'd, I'd what? I'd, I'd tell her. I'd explain. The movie was great, but the director's French, and maybe she had another video to watch instead because this might be inappropriate. I loved it, but I wasn't thinking. I'd apologize, and she'd let it go. She'd probably even want to watch it more then, but I would have diffused any misunderstandings. It wouldn't mean anything, and we could laugh about it and watch the movie like grown-ups. Then I'd take a taxi and salvage an hour of Saturday night before going home. That's how it would go. My fingers tapped the seat beside me again and I pulled them back into my lap. It would have been better if we'd met in the city. My hand found its way to my belly and I breathed into it. It would all be fine. She had a baby and a husband. I turned my attention to the station walls, those incredible old city walls that were even dirtier, buried under even more layers of soot than Manhattan's, but the color themes were still prominent, and I spotted insignias on the wall for each station we passed. Borough Hall with the top BH in an old serif font inside an indigo box. Nevins with a simple white N for a logo. Atlantic Station with a black A in a white circle with gold filigree. Bergen, a white bee on violet in a pale green frame. They were stunning, hidden under grime. What would it have been like to ride the subway in 1904 when the system opened? The train stopped at Grand Army Plaza and I stepped off. When it pulled away, it revealed the insignia hidden behind it, a mustard pea against a charcoal background. I was a designer, a typographer by avocation, if not by profession. I stared at this icon, at these walls, and realized, once again, I was still only waking in this city. Scratch a surface and God knew what you'd find. 
Two trains reeled in and out of the station behind me. My nerves jangled and my adrenaline increased. Finally, I turned, walked up the concrete steps and into the night. Down the long slope of Flatbush Avenue, the old Williamsburg Savings Bank building and its narrow clock tower rose, dark and taller than everything around it, a few of its office windows lit. Below, car lights twinkled, flashed red and white as the string of traffic lights above them rippled from green to yellow to red. I walked downhill, turned right at the first corner, and continued up a dark, quiet, tree-lined street toward a red brick structure at 223 Sterling Avenue. A small courtyard separated two wings of the building, and through the glass, a single vase of purple irises stood against a beige wall on a vacated doorman's desk. Inside the first set of doors, I examined the list of names on a small silver panel to find Marino 7C. I hesitated at pressing the black square button beside it, feeling as if two, three, four, God knew how many parts of myself were watching. As each began to clarify, to take on traits, specifics, I worked harder to ignore them. The feline one, the canine, the one waiting in shadows, the one laughing at how dense I could be. One was female, her head tilted and her eyes slid expectantly. One was a child blinking in the light while stronger, surer hands led it forward. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for reading that, Steve. Um, so much is going on in that passage, and you can feel John. I mean, I can feel John's nerves as you're reading that, and and the deep perspective, and just and and also just the the way that you're blending the past and the present. Um, it, it it's really great. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and yet there's more. <laughs> I will say. Um. One thing that's that's not in that passage that I'll ask you about is um, so during this time it's the late '80s in the New York timeline, um, New York part of the novel, and uh, the AIDS epidemic is going on, and um, John and Elena have a coworker who that affects greatly, and um, for me that character's losses and the, the losses John experiences, all of that. Um, and that being in the background really seemed like it raised the emotional stakes of the novel. Um, I, I just wondered how you thought about it, um, how you thought about that time interacting with your your fictional world and how you put all that together or came up with the idea. Yeah, I mean, again, I was I was there then and everyone that was there then that was paying any attention. Uh, I mean, I think everyone was affected by this. You had to you 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 wanted a love life. Right. But but what? this would you i mean again it was just so intense you would um you would be all jacked up on beautiful people and maybe you're dating someone and you're excited and you're wondering where this is going to go and you, and you turn and you run into someone who's 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 visibly dying from this on the street in the subway you know it's everywhere again i was in theater so it was just your heroes are dying from this while you're still trying to you know it's like love love is a risk. We don't. We want it to not be a risk, but it's 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 a it's risky in and of itself. And in this book, it is for for John and 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 Elena, and and uh, I, I just to do that time truly, I wanted to bring this element in 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 as well, and and have it. I mean, because it just back then it felt like it shadowed everything, and you had to be figure out how brave you were going to be about this. And 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 there were times I'd be so freaked out, like, I can't date anyone. And then I'd have to, no, I can't live like this, you know, and have to fight through. And and I I wanted uh, Jeremy, who's, he's, I mean, there are three really strong, I mean, he's one of the three main characters in the, uh, in the, uh, the adult section and he's just this he's this gorgeous charismatic gay man who elena loves dearly they have one of those real intimate uh, uh relationships friendships that that you you see like that and and uh they're they all have um and i mean and and they're all kind of uh like like john and and uh jeremy or they they're kind of jealous of whoever's getting attention from Elena and Elena's kind of it's subtle but this stuff goes on in offices and so so they all are kind of a little bit in competition for 
with each other and they're all kind of in love with each other. They're about the same age. They all like, like uh, Jeremy's a photographer and, and uh, John is a, like a poster designer becoming an artist. And Elena, it's what she does with, with fashion, with makeup, and she creates these effects. And so they, they have all this in common. And, and um, as the story progresses, I mean, like someone said, it's like, almost like a love triangle and it is. Um, Jeremy kind of, he's, he's mischievous and charming in that way. And he kind of elbows them together a little bit and then it happens. And he becomes confidant to, to both of them about this. So, so he's, uh, I, I really, that relationship, the way the three work together is, is real important to me. And, and it just seemed, again, I don't know how you don't write about this. How do you don't write about AIDS and what all that meant and write about this time, especially in New York City or San Francisco or someplace like that. So it's just a part of, of what was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this question is sort of sort of connected. Um, and, you know, so so the adult part of the book, as you're calling it, New York, uh, there's this intense love affair. And so a, a part of a core of that are, you know, that you're going to have to write sex scenes. And, you know, we talked about this. Do we go there? Do we not go there? But I think it's something writers, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to write. Um, and you you did have to write multiple ones for this particular novel. And so so were you intimidated by that? Were you um, worried about writing them? How, how did that go? And do you have any advice? Yeah, I've thought a lot about this. Honestly, I was scared shitless. can say shitless. I was scared shitless <laughs> to write these things. Um, but once I knew that I was going to write this story, I knew that this was what it was about. And I would have to go directly at it and, and not flinch. Because flinching is like you're you're walking a tightrope. It's kind of you're walking a tightrope with these and you don't look down. That's then then you're then you're screwed. And and I, I knew I, I knew again to go directly at them. And I have a thing with with writing. If I'm afraid of something, if there's fear in something, I move towards that because often there's a charge there. And, um, and and something that has a lot of energy for me that I should explore. I mean, the great thing about writing is that you never have to show it to anybody. You can just go there and see what you can find and then you can, can make it feel safer to you and, and do it. But with this case, because it really is about uh, love and desire connected. And uh, I, and John is, he's a, has a really delicate eye, but he sees, he's, he's, he's a visual artist. And so he, I knew that that to describe them delicately, but directly and truthfully through him, his experience of it, go deep into the heart of, of um, his experience and, and what he how he feels for this woman and the impact she has on them. And I just needed to go directly into this or this book wasn't gonna work. And so, and I think about it, I don't know how many, they, they spend a lot of time next to each other in bed or wherever, I'm trying to think, it feels like I've got about five sex scenes between them, and um, which is a lot. And then there's a couple of other with with women, young women before him. But those are those are kind of different. So so it's kind of like when you the way to, to manage the way I manage this is uh, here are my tips. <laughs> uh, if you want to try this at home, kids, here are my here are my tips. Um, the first thing, and it's going to seem kind of obvious, but but it helps you, I think, just to have the courage to go ahead and write them and know that you can design these so they actually have impact if you're going to have to have several of them. I mean, the first thing, if I didn't have to have one of these in a book, I wouldn't put it in there. I wouldn't just throw one in. Like, um, I, I, I once heard a director talk about, and I think it's true, that nine out of ten times when you go to a movie and there's a sex scene, the action, the, the narrative just stops cold. And people don't think about it because these are actors and they're pretty and they're, you know, we kind of want to see that, but but it really doesn't often have a whole lot to do with the story. And and that's a real danger. And um, and in a book where we don't have cameramen and beautiful actors doing this stuff, and the writer, I'm sorry, the reader's building the story inside their head, you can't afford just to have a dead uh scene like that. That's when people will judge it. And that's the big fear that I had, and we all have when we write this, is that, you know, like our, our Aunt Lucy's looking over our shoulder, going to judge us for our sex scene <laughs> that we wrote. And you're like, Ugh. you, you got to get rid of that. So so what I, I think is, is is that first you want to make sure that, and this just makes sense, but that every sex scene needs to be different than the other ones. They need to have a difference. And um 
and they each one should show us something different about the characters in them. We should get to know something about the characters from seeing them there that we didn't know before. And then the, the third thing is that, I mean, if you can do it all, that's really what you want to do. The story should turn with the sex scene too. So the something in the story should move forward, just like the narrative should always be, be moving forward through every scene, ideally, right? Nothing's perfect, but that's what we want. So if you can do all those things, and it doesn't have to be as you know big and dramatic as I'm saying. I mean, let's say you're you're writing a story, you know, about you know a, a love story about a couple getting together, and maybe there's only one sex scene, and it's at the let's say the the 25 percent end of Act One moment. They have a sex scene there, and it's the only one. And it doesn't have to be designed like I'm designing this whole arc of these things, right? But let's say the couple they get together, they have sex, and you don't have to show a whole lot. Show a little bit. Show more. Um, and um and 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 then the story changes it keeps going forward well you've you've shown a little bit so we've learned something about them from the sex scene and the story has um has moving from that now they're lovers they weren't lovers before so it had story movement and it's valid and so that's just the bottom line it's just make sure that that whenever you do it it has story value and then the the reader won't suddenly realize they're just reading a, a dead sex scene which is how you get into trouble with these things so those are my tips and good luck. Good luck to all. Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to take us from that back to back to place just a minute. Um, and then we'll open it up for some questions here. But um, I did want to ask you also about um, the Irish pubs. I remember I read your novel and, and I told you that I felt like I'd been on a tour of Irish pubs in a good way. Like, um, and um but I also I also noticed, you know, John is that's like one of his go to places like he really likes he feels at home there. Um, and I started thinking, oh, you know, his mom's al was an alcoholic kind of absentee mom. Um, and I wondered if if that was something you set up or if you just if that just sort of happened um, that he, he felt at home at these places, if that was calling back to his mom or something or, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, I was glad you when you told me you 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 uh, thought it was like in a good way a tour of Irish pubs because I heard from I just wrote it I didn't know I wasn't planning this at all I just know when I'm in New York I like to go to the pubs you know and John needed a place to go and uh, it's a way that and it's really it's a real community there you know you you engage with people you can have a beer it's 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 much I think it's really it's more like like in Europe or in Ireland um, there. It's it's less, I mean, it's surreal. It's about getting loaded for people, but but it really is about you can go and have a beer and meet some people or just talk to them and then um and then and then move on. So uh, but the thing is I was aware that that um that alcohol and substance is in the book. And we've got the alcoholic mom and we have a sister that gets into trouble with it too. And um and so I, it made sense that John, he kind of self-medicates when he's tense and stuff. He goes, gets a beer, you know, he needs to shift. He goes, gets a beer in the pub where there are people and he can shift himself. So I was thinking about that. I had not, but I mean, this is perfectly valid. I had not thought to connect that to his mom and childhood in any way. But again, we don't know what we're doing a lot of times when we're, we're writing this stuff. I think we write truly and, 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 and make the place real and, and immerse ourselves in it. And things will come in that, that we're, we weren't planning just because we're very there, very much there. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, I, I don't know if there are any questions, if there are, um, Um, so far, we haven't got any questions. If, if people want to put them in there, I'm I'm always interested in the book's journey, you know, and as, you know, an aspiring writer myself, you know, just sticking with a book, you know, and just can you elaborate a little bit more on the journey that this book took towards publication and sticking with it? And just I'm struck by how when you said that, you you know, the sex scenes, for example, have a particular arc. I mean, all that is all that work going into the manuscript when it's uncertain what it's going to become. And I think a lot of people are interested in that because it's so beautiful. Uh, the section you read, the, the way you crafted the sentences, but how did you stick with that through the kind of ups and downs of radio silence, hearing no, like it seems very inspiring to see how the book ended up being published. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, this, it's a, it was a long journey. Uh, and I mean, this is the argument for 
not giving up. If you write a book, I mean, the thing is, I love this book. I'll just say that flat out. I love this book. It's very important to me. I have, I have some, uh, I have some other novels. It, it was hard for me to learn how to construct. I mean, and now I edit people's work, but but I was a natural short form writer, and for me to learn how to write a long form, which is different, I didn't realize how different it was conceptually, really. Um, it took me a long time. So I've got a couple drafts of novels that are sitting in the drawer, right? But I wrote this one and I know this is not one that I want to let sit in the drawer. And and it this is what, and this happens more often than, than we would like. So I don't want to disillusion anyone, but the argument is that you want to stay with it and, and then you can get it published. But I, I, um, I had a, a good clean draft of this. It was ready to show an agent. Uh, yeah, I'll just say it was in 2014. It was that long ago. And I just won the Pushcart Prize, which is, you know, really throws light on you. And I go, everything is coming together. I'm going to be a famous writer next week. You know, it's all happening. And uh, uh, and and I, I got this agent. She was a big agent. And uh, I don't have any anything at all bad to say about her. She tried to she tried to get it out there. But it was quick and she's got big clients. She doesn't have a lot of time for somebody who's, who's brand new. And um, and so it was it was a rather quick around the park. And and then it was over. And boy, talk about a crash was after that, because I, I, I just, you know, that's why I went under the bed for three days and not not knowing what to do. So I but I crawled out and um Put it away for this really it's what happened to put it away for about a year and i'm working on other things and you know when i finally the the the, the pain was diminished enough i i pulled it out and reread it and i'm like no i believe in this book i believe in this book still it's a good book and and i'd send it out but i'm still pretty raw i'd send it out to you know uh, you know an agent maybe or one contest and get the nose again and then i'd go back underground work on other things and then pull it out in another ear and look at it, you know? So I did this, not sending it to a whole bunch of people because once something gets turned down by, by big houses, um, the first time they have to read so many books, they often will just use that as an excuse to not read it. So it's hard to break in once you've, and they know it's already been somewhere. And, um, but basically I just kept believing in it. I had a joke that they're gonna be burying me in the ground and dead, and I'm still going to go zombie on them to be shoving the manuscript up through the earth, saying, "Take it, it's good," you know. And, and so, I, I, and and it was just kind of a random thing that I saw that uh, University of Wisconsin had an open window for uh, for manuscripts that didn't have to be agented or asked for, and I just threw it at them, and. Um, and I, of course, all through there, I kept editing it, making little edits every time I read it. But uh, you know, and then and then they got in touch with me, and and they wanted it, and it was super great. It's like it was amazing, really. And uh, and I worked with them, and and we worked on 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 uh, you know just making it better. So this has been with me a long time, and uh, that's the journey. But you know, here here we are. So and bottom line, I'll say, if you love your work just you you might really have to grind it out it can happen immediately it can just go right through you see that happen or it doesn't and if you again if you love it you just stay with it and always write something else in the meantime so that that's my advice on this i love that i love that um does anybody else have any other questions if you can you can unmute yourself i just also want to say i love that you said that if you're if you're fearful about something uh, writing you go right toward it and i feel like that is kind of the um it seems counterintuitive but it's a real strength in the work right yeah 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 because that's i mean it's real interesting i i have a friend who writes and he's with him he uses the word shame um like it's, if something he finds shame in his work, he goes and explores that, right? If he's ashamed of, ashamed of something, but that's kind of like fear. I like fear better. I kind of come from a fear family. Uh, I have to fight through fear. And uh, and so for me, it's really a little thing. Like if there's something over there I'm afraid to write about, something's going on over there and I need to I need to go at it and look at it. And, and again, I say this because, because again, I come from a theater background and, you know, talk about exposed actors on stage doing this like live in front of people. 
But lucky us writers, we get to sit in our room or wherever and just explore this stuff and and we can go to scary places and pull and pull back. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna just tell a little bit more about that too, something I wanted to say. When when I got my first draft of this novel down, I was, you know, I was, I can be brave when I write, but when I send it into the world, I'm like, oh my God. Um, I was, my biggest fear was, you know, the fact that that this this character, I mean, he's really in love, he loves women, he's in love with women and these sex scenes. And I'm like, oh my God, what's gonna, am I gonna be exiled, you know, from this? And um, I have a friend and she's a, she's a really good writer and she's really sharp and uh, she's also tough and she doesn't suffer fools gladly. And she said she would read it. And she was the first person I sent it to. And really I was just, I was so raw and exposed with it. And, uh, and I didn't, I just didn't know. <laughs> and, and then she responded so positively to this aspect because it, it comes from the heart of the character that that's what made it work for her. And uh, I mean, and I mean, I just almost, yeah, I wanted to cry just that my God has sent it to this, this woman I respect a lot. And, and she really, she, not only did she love the book, but she responded specifically to that aspect. So um, anyway, that was, but, but you, I think we, if we're not exposing ourselves with our writing somehow, if we're not putting something out there, then wh why do we expect people to be interested in it? And it, it doesn't have to be super dramatic, but, but it has to have meaning for us. Otherwise, uh, other, otherwise, it's not going to have meaning for them, I think. So, yeah. like it. That's right. I love it. Does anybody yeah. else have any questions? Or Ramona, do you have any uh, final thoughts? I do. Uh, hi, this is Jeff Aiken, Steve. Hi, Jeff. I've really enjoyed this, and uh, Blake, I love this format. Um, <clears throat> so. I guess I have two questions. Uh, first, how did you come, how did you evolve, I guess, to where you're helping people with their work? I guess I'm, I'm assuming that's your main living. Yeah. You know, how did that come about? And then second question, maybe I missed this, but um, did you have some thought of, I, sh I need to write a, a book even without an idea? Did you feel like it's just something I've got to accomplish in my life? Wait, of, what kind, of what kind of book did you say? Oh, just a book. I just, just was it something along the lines of I just have to write a book even before you had an idea. Yeah. So that's my is how the book. You did talk about how you came up with this idea, but I'm trying to get to the interval in time before that. Right. Uh, yeah, actually, I've always wanted to write a book. Uh, I, I just felt there was a need that I had a book in me, hopefully more. Um, and and it's it's been strong. I mean, the, like I see the the short form, like I've got stuff out there in short form, but I've never been able to manage a complete, you know, the architectural long book. And I just had a need to do it, and I I couldn't give up trying. I I, I spent some years trying to figure this out, studying screenwriting and other things. How to technically do this? How is it done? Um, uh, just just so I, I I could do it, and then you have to have a, a story that fits. But yeah, it's it was a drive in there. I mean, it's, I'd go to my, again. I would go to the grave still trying to do that if if I hadn't been able to get this one done. Um, how did I get into the writing, coaching, and editing stuff? Um, the thing it took a while. Yeah, I mean, it all came out of getting kicked out in New York City and not being able to get a, a job. And I love talking about writing process and uh, uh, craft. And I just, I'm just, I'm just a, a real nerd about it. And uh, it's a good time for me. And uh, I love that when I got my MFA, we'd go out and have, you know, go to a bar and go to an Irish pub and drink beer and talk about <laughs> writing and, and all this stuff. So for, for me, I, I started, I think one of the reasons I was able to do this um, is I started with, uh, um, I started with poetry. Then again, I went theater. I studied acting. I studied jazz guitar. I was, until I discovered poetry, I was doing all this other art stuff, trying to, because I knew I needed to do something here. And so what I ended up doing is learning a lot about other art forms. So when I finally figured out way down the road that I was into prose and that I wanted to, you know, um, I had been exposed to a lot of different ways of looking at art. I also have a, friends in, in, um, 
um, a lot of painter friends. So I talk to them about it, even though it's really it's really different for me. So I think that's one thing that happened. And I've I took this. There's this Briggs Meyer test, and I have the the therapy gene uh, apparently that they say if you get this this sort of numbers show up, you'd be a good therapist. So I've got that, and then a bunch of ways of looking at it, and I'm just really kind of passionate about. Uh, again, the writing process. And so you throw losing a job into that. And I scrambled and just started building this thing. And it is, it's how I make my whole living. So um, I've been lucky about that, but it took a while, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I did put Steve and Ramona's websites um, in the chat. So you can go there and, uh, uh, if you haven't ordered their books, they're available there. And then more about Steve's uh, editing and coaching there as well. I I have a question for Steve. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Ramona and Steve, I think you both are on my Facebook. You know, you are my friends there. Um, my question is, um, what is your, I haven't read your book. So what is your book, would you say? is comparable what other books or what what books were you influenced by okay you this um these are older books but but i know there was some impact and i did, mm -hmm. I did read these um but the the this is going to be terrible I'm, i have really struggled with names people my, my favorite poet i can never remember his name or one of them but um the lover by duras thank god i got it by M marguerite duras Yes, and it, it's different, but there's a lot of the similar sort of I kind of want to write it, you know, kind of a guy's version, something. I mean, they're again, they're different, but that that is one. And it was a very passionate torrid affair. Very that a lot of yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of others that I that I like, like I read the, the passion. I mean, this was a really important book for me, but the passion by uh Winterson, uh, Jeanette Winterson. It's different, but somehow this influenced me. It's just, it's just the stuff that vibrated with me. And also I would throw in that the, the hours uh, by uh, Cunningham that came and these all were, I mean, these are go back some, some years, right. but, uh, but there was a feeling with um, the way he, he's talking about that time and it deals with age and it's in New York and around. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful, uh, novel. So I would I would say those three uh, off the top. Yeah, sounds like a lot of character driven kind of story. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I, I do believe in plot. I mean, I'm a big plot believer because you want people turning the page. You always do. But yeah, it they are about characters and emotion and all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Into reality. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being our Facebook friend, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I checked. Your name sounded familiar, so I checked you both are yeah. my Facebook friends. Good to know you, Texas authors. Hey, Steve, we have a question in the chat. I'm just going to go ahead and read it because um, their microphone's not working. But okay. how many revised drafts of Remember This do you have? In other words, how much revision did you do before you sold it? And how do you keep a story fresh in while while revising multiple times yeah that's just a okay i mean that's a damn good question you know all writers are different so i'll just say say what i i have it's like i can i can look on to see how i mean the number of drafts of this because once i start changing something this is going to be inaccurate because once i start changing something uh i save a draft and uh, i mean i have no idea i mean there's so many drafts of this thing i shouldn't even go there but but yeah if i'm if i'm going in and i'm altering things like like kind of in a big way i say i'm going to change stuff i always save a new draft of it i have i really have no idea because i would just kept going over it um how to keep it fresh well here's again this is just my idea we always have to figure this stuff out on the fly um if the first draft i mean you know the first couple of drafts the first draft for me is the diff. Well, I mean, for everybody, probably it's it's the really hard one, um, because you've got to, you know, you don't even know if you're going to finish it, right? And and you've got to keep just having the faith and keep moving. 
and and heading toward that end. And this is when I'm coaching people. I'm saying, hey, you know, this is you don't have to bring in the A like Ramona was saying. We think these these things come out like these perfect eggs. Writers don't write novels like chickens lay eggs. It didn't happen that way. You know, we don't see where the cracks are or where the holes are and all this 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 mess of a first draft. So and I just don't think that a first draft can come out like that, you have to allow for imperfection. So I tell people, I say, look, man, just, just give me the C minus version of this. I mean, this is what, um, again, forgetting somebody's name, the shitty first draft, help me. You know what I'm talking about. Anne Lamont. Anne Lamont. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> this is a great book. I love that book. Um, and, but it's so hard to keep in your mind because you we, we see these perfect books and it's the example we have. And it'd be better if we could see early drafts, I think, how they would would build up to the final thing. That would be really interesting. But uh but for me to just to keep it going, if I'm if I get a draft down and I'm excited by it, then then because I mean again I've been working at this a long time. I get more excited at that point because I have something shaped out. And I know I can go through just section by section and make it better. And that I can just pass through it a bunch of times and 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 do it. Now, what to do if if people don't respond, if if it doesn't um hit, and um, you know, you have this book you wrote, and how do you keep your I don't know, I don't know that. Um again, I have a couple, well, the first, the first my first couple of tries didn't work. They weren't very good, but I needed to get them out to get to the next one, right? You write the book you're writing now so that you get to the next book you're going to write. Um, and, and sometimes I say you stay at it as long as you can stand to stay at it. And if you just get burned out and you can't do it anymore, get away from it. Like, like often in a first draft of a, of a novel, a long work, I will figure I'll, I'll get in the middle of it and I'll just be burned out. And I go, I need to do something different. So you can not, um, you can frankly not just take off a week or go to the beach or something. Um, but, but I often will write something short in the middle of it. Like I'll have an idea for an essay or a short story, write something short, just something totally different and finish it because these things wear you down because they're so long. So, um, you know, so those are little tricks you can do just to kind of stay with it. But I, I just think you have to, you know, keep the faith. And again, I put this, this one I put in a drawer for a year and because it just hurt so bad when it didn't land. And, um, but I couldn't let it go. And that's the sign there. So I pulled it out and read it again. And so that's the thing. Sometimes maybe you can just put it away for a year and write something different, then pull it out and look at it. And you'll see it with fresh eyes. Fresh eyes, I'm making this long, but fresh eyes are a good way to keep keep the energy moving. That's that's my, I think my final, final solution. Thank you, Steve. Does anybody else have a question they either want to put in the chat or unmute them? Uh, Susan, did you have a question? Let me, uh, I'm asking to unmute you here. Let's see. Can you take yourself off mute? There you go, Susan. Okay, can you hear? Yes, yes. Thank you. It's something about the way you spoke about your book, um, Steve, that I was thinking of the hours before you even explained how important that um, that book is to you. And I'm interested in windows also, like I write poetry and that could be a connection between them, like in a chat book. You know, you look out and you see the sky at night, you see birds, you see a neighbor, you know, you mind associations. But I just was amazed that you're so in tune with your work and the way you talk about it that I picked up on the hours that I've just pictured that movie right away. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. And 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 I just when I read the book and saw the movie, it's amazing that movie worked. Big. I don't know how you make a movie out of that, but they did. Uh it just felt I just felt a real kinship to the uh the story and the 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 language and the and the tonality and the interconnecting thing, you know. But I just felt, you know, this is one of my brothers out there, you know. It just was like that. So that that's real interesting that you you're already going there. I look forward to finding your poetry also. Oh, thanks. The poetry is so long ago you can't even uh, find it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I I went to these other things and I, I love poetry, but it's I 
you can only surf. So I was trying to be a jazz guitarist too. I had to leave that behind, you know. Oh, connection, huh? <laughs> only serve so many gods, right? Yeah. You get that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really energizing and inspiring. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Susan. Um, does anybody else have a, a reaction, a comment, or anything else before we wrap up tonight? Well, thank you for being here, Ramona, Steve. Such uh, an invigorating, inspiring conversation. Thanks to you both and for great questions, Ramona. Um, I've got Steve and Ramona's uh, website uh, links in the chat. Um, we'll send out a video recording of this that we'll post to YouTube. Uh, you can reach Ramona and Steve on their website, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, things of that nature. So thank you all for being here. Happy writing, happy reading, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, y'all. Really you. enjoyed this. Thank yeah. you so much. Bye. Good night. Bye, y'all. Good night.